the rest of you to take your Bibles again to the book of Romans. Romans chapter 10. Romans chapter 10. As we dig and make a little more progress into the book of Romans. Romans 10. This morning, Lord willing, we'll be looking at verses 14 to 21. Let's read the text and ask God to illumine our hearts to it. Romans chapter 10. I'll read verse 13. Let's read the end of the chapter. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How will they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? How are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed what he has heard from us? So faith comes from hearing, and hearing through the word of Christ. But I ask, have they not heard? Indeed they have. For their voice has gone out through all the earth, and their words to the ends of the world. But I ask, did Israel not understand? First Moses says, I will make you jealous of those who are not a nation. With a foolish nation, I will make you angry. And then Isaiah is so bold to say, I have been found by those who do not seek me. I have shown myself to those who do not ask for me. But of Israel, he says, all day long, I have held out my hands to disobedient and contrite people. Let's ask God to illumine our hearts to his word. Father, would you take now the sword of your spirit and use it in our lives, we pray. We ask that you would open our eyes. Lord, would you give us ears to hear? Lord, there are some familiar verses in this text. Could you help us not to assume we have understood and applied them, but to um, be afresh of, of your word this morning. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Do you remember who or what the agent was that first shared the gospel with you? Um, who was the first person to show you the beauty of Christ? Can you think of who they are? Did you have in mind? Maybe your mind had to go back a ways, right? Um, maybe, maybe that was a gospel track that was left somewhere and you have no idea who left it there. Maybe it's a, a radio program that you happened upon or a book that you, someone gave you. Or, um, I had... Probably, I'm assuming, my grandparents and my parents had maybe shared or told me about the gospel. But when I first really kind of heard it was about first grade, down in the basement of the West Milford Baptist Church in West Milford, West Virginia. And a dear sweet couple who were teaching that Sunday school class talked to us about how we could know for sure if we died today if we go to heaven. And if we wanted to talk more to stay after class. I remember our friend John and I stayed after and they told us the gospel and I remember hearing it and thinking, well, this just makes sense and uh, prayed and received Christ as my Savior. And those are dear, sweet folks. Um, who was the first, the agent that God used to share the gospel? It was God who saves us, but he uses means. God's plan Verses 14 to 21 show us God's plan for the nations and the urgency of evangelism. So as we've come into chapter 10 of Romans, remember chapters 9, 10, and 11 are a unit. Uh, chapters 9 and 11 both talking about God's sovereignty and salvation. Chapter 10 talking about the human responsibility in it. And as we get into chapter the end of chapter 11, this grand benediction of worship 
of this doxology of what's going on. So we, we've seen before um, how the, in chapter 9, God's sovereignty and salvation, that salvation is all of mercy, nothing we do. And that God starts it, he initiates it, and he completes it, and that the nature of it is based upon promise, not on ethnicity or merit or how we work or anything like that. And that God in this, has this is not some, something that just came about. This has always been his plan to include the Gentiles in the people of God, even while unbelieving Jews might not be a part of the people of God in that case. And so chapter 10 answers the question, well, why haven't more of those Jews obtained this righteousness? And he gave us that answer that, they, uh, that many people miss out on this because they're, they're finding it in a, something that they do rather than something that's already been done. That they're seeking in a wrong means in a wrong manner through their own works to receive righteousness from the law rather than accepting that alien righteousness from Christ. And so after discussing the sovereign purpose of, purposes of God in chapter 9, he discusses the human factors like the necessity of evangelism and the urgency for it. And so the last time we saw the nature of how we believe and that our faith, the organ of our belief is faith and that we, the heart, and it's something we need to know and it's something for the whole person, the heart, that our, 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 the, how the minds, emotions, and volition are all part of the heart, the inner man, the true you, and that it's something for everyone, as we saw as we came, that, that this is for everyone who believes that there's no distinction, verse 12, between Jew and Greek, for the same is Lord above all, bestowing his riches on all who call on him, that this is the, this is the most inclusive message. It's creating this most inclusive community, and that's where we left off last week. Now, this most inclusive message needs to get to the most people possible. And so last time we talked about the way we respond to the, the gospel, that we respond by receiving him, calling on the name of the Lord, believing in our heart that God's raised him from the dead and confessing with our mouth. Um, and we said that salvation is as close as our mouth and our heart. If we confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in our heart that God's raised him from the dead, we will be saved. And so, so we talked about then how we respond, but now, as we get to verse 14 to the end, he's going to talk about how we help others respond to the gospel. So here's the deal. We, we used to, at the end of the service, would say, if anyone needs to respond to the message, and there's a little bit of an issue with that because everyone in this room, myself included, is supposed to be responding to the Word of God. We all respond to every message every time it's preached. There may be some that need help in their responding to the message preached, and that's where we'd have time to talk to someone, someone to talk, sit with someone. So we talked last time about the way we respond, and today we're going to talk about how we help others respond. This whole chapter gives us an instruction and inspiration for modern day evangelism. I mean, this is really God's plan, and he gives us this picture of this, that, that Paul's heart, he shows us already in chapter 10, Paul's heart for unbelieving Israel, the necessity of faith, how it's exclusive, there's only one way, as Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, the life, no one comes to the Father but by me. And that it needs to assert certain doctrines, like believing in the resurrection, and that Jesus died for our sins. And here, he's going to talk about the urgency of this message being proclaimed and heralded. And so, but it really starts in verse 13, when it says, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. Now, here's what's cool about that. Verse 13 has already been shared with us in the book of Acts, and it's a quote from the book of Joel. And I actually want to put this on the screen. So here's, here's the same in, in, in Joel, and it shall come to pass that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Now, I want you to look there. This is some, some um, 
it, it, the, the word Lord there is in all caps. What's a, that a signal for? That's a signal for that this is the covenant name of God, the Tetragrammaton. This is the Lord Yahweh, or as the older translations would say, Jehovah. The, who, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Now let's see it in the book of Acts. The same one that they're referring back to this from Joel. And it shall come to pass that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Now, let's go back to um, where we are in uh, Romans, where it says, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord, for everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Now, uh, this, is, this is a little simple observation, but I think it's super beneficial and super profound and, and helpful for us. In Romans 10, 13, to whom is Paul applying the title Lord? Jesus. The Apostle Paul, the Pharisee of the Pharisees, schooled at Gamaliel, is saying that Yahweh of the Old Testament, the Jehovah God, that Jesus is him. He is speaking of the divinity of and the person of Jesus, he is applying this to who Jesus is. Don't miss this. It's simple, it's a basic observation, but it's immensely profound. This is how Paul viewed Jesus as the fully divine Son of God. Or as we sing, He is Lord. He is Lord. He is risen from the grave, and He is Lord. Every knee shall bow, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Now verse 13 then sparks a series of questions in verses 14 and following. And it shares these conditions necessary for calling on the Lord in a series of these rhetorical questions and then tells us then that every one of these conditions is met for the Jews. Now it is speaking of the missionary call and often this is used in like a missionary conference. But what, one of the things that Paul is trying to say here is remember that the context is referring to the Jews and whether they believed or not. And what he's saying is these are the conditions necessary for belief in receiving and calling on the name of the Lord. And yes, they have been met for them. And I'm going to share you with you lots of verses from the Old Testament, Paul says, to show you that this has been done. So the first point that I would point out is that the conditions necessary for belief. There's a series of questions. David Platt says of this that these verses don't just depict Paul's rhetorical skill. They are a clear picture of God's redemptive plan. In these three short verses, we see God's design for taking the gospel to all people in the world, including the billion who have never heard the name of Jesus. So you'll notice as you read there, how shall they call on him who they not believed? Think of these verbs. And how shall they believe in him they've never heard? And how shall they hear without someone preaching? And how shall they preach unless they are sent? Call, believe, hear, preach, sent. Call, believe, hear, preach, sent. There's a progression there. Okay? Now, John Stott said that these verbs but in opposite order, show us the essence of Paul's argument. So in order they are call, believe, hear, preach, sent. Let's reverse that. Send, preach, hear, believe, call. This is the commission and the work of the church. Send, preach, hear, believe, call. Who does God, how does God accomplish people calling on the name of the Lord and all those that will be saved? Well, he sends servants. What do they do? They preach. The word preach just means to herald. This is someone going out in the streets. Uh, before you posted it online, you went out and shouted it out in the streets. Um, you, you, before you shared it on Snapgram and um, um, Instant Grandparents, Instagram, um, um, and uh, I, I have, uh, okay, um, or 
your, your MySpace page, before you shared news there, you had a herald that would go out in the streets and do that. This is what a preach just means to herald. Preach what? The message. The, the message of Christ, the Word of God, the Word of Christ, the message of the Gospel. God has every one of his followers a part of this discipleship process. God's plan is to send his servants, this, these heralds. Christ sends heralds. Heralds preach. People hear. Hearers believe. Believers call. And so this happens. So this shows the necessity of hearing the gospel. And if, if, you, if hearing the gospel is important and, is, and necessary, then messengers heralding it are essential. The principle is taught in these verses applies both to the Jews and the Gentiles. The steps must be realized, each of these steps must be realized if people are going to, if people are going to call the name of the Lord, they have to believe before they call upon the name of the Lord. And if they're going to believe, they have to have heard. And they can't hear without someone telling them. And they can't, no one can tell them unless they're sent. And so it is important to hear. This is an important principle for contemporary missions. This is important for the local church to understand about what evangelism is. He tells them there, and he asks some questions, how their voice has gone out in all the world. Now this is speaking, he's quoting from um, Psalm 19. And remember Paul had already talked about this in Romans 1, how people receive natural revelation and they see this, and so they're without excuse, but natural revelation is not enough for them to receive the gospel. They need to be told about what Jesus did for them. They can't just look at the sky and the mountains and the beach and say, oh wow, I understand Jesus died on a cross for my sins. They know God is there. They know they're not God and they need, they need something from God. And if they're looking for him, they need someone to tell them who he is. And that's where gospel heralds come in. Heralding the message someone shares is vital. The, if the message is not preached, it's not going to be preached unless someone's sent. And what they proclaim is the message of God's Son. Th th get this. Heralding and evangelism is heralding the gospel. It's not a program. It's not an event. It is heralding the gospel. You have not done evangelism. You have not done outreach unless you heralded the gospel of God's Son. Otherwise, you just did slick marketing for a nonprofit social and entertainment club. Evangelism is when we herald the evangel, the evangel, the good news, the gospel of Jesus Christ. We forget that the gospel is good news. Evangelism in the New Testament is not a program. You're not going to go in the New Testament and see their plans or whatever. You're gonna, we're not smarter than God. They take the gospel and they share it, they herald it with others. And so when we as Westerners, we often want to shift the burden to others or outsource the burden so that we can have someone else to criticize or blame. But God calls us and sends us to share this message. Um, I think it was D.L. Moody that there was someone who came and they complained and criticized. Well, see how this guy's evangelizing, and don't you think he's not doing it the right way? Or don't you think, and we see the same thing, whether it was the 1800s or early 1900s with Moody or now. Well, th the way these people are doing outreach, that's not as effective, and they should do it this way. It's a more of an effective way. Or, or this is here. Or I don't like the way this guy's. And I've had that where I saw someone, maybe I thought they were a little harsh or the way they came across, and I was like, hey, that's, that's probably not the best way to do evangelism. And D.L. Moody said something like this. He says, I like the way that that guy's doing evangelism wrong better than the way you're not doing it at all. You see, see that? At least he's doing something. Um, so be careful there. Yeah, those people that are just weird, and they're going out with their big giant Bibles and knocking on doors, and that's probably not the... Well, how'd you do it this week? Oh, you did nothing. Well, I like the way they're doing it better than the way you're not. Okay, um, uh, there might be something to learn, uh, but there, but 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 um, you know, you get the point. There's an urgency here. Paul has an urgency to get the message to everyone on earth. 
Luther said it this way. He said, it would not matter if Christ died a thousand times if no one heard about it. The, the preaching of the gospel is an essential part of the gospel process. G Gentiles and Jews can only hear the gospel, and they need people, agents, to share it. It needs us. God calls us to that. And then in verses 18 to 21, he shows that these conditions are met. Israel can't then respond and say, well, we've not had the opportunity to hear. Um, ever done that where you, you told your kids, your grandkids something like a hundred times, and then they're like, well, I didn't know about that. You know, um, uh, folks that work in church offices is kind of one of those jokes, like they have t-shirts. It's been in the bulletin. It's been there three weeks or something like that. You know, that type of thing. Or, or kids at school, like, hey, we told you this was going to happen. Oh, we didn't know about that. And it's like, oh, no, you only got three texts, four phone calls, and a... Um, you know, we, we knew, it was, but Israel can't say, hey, I didn't know about that. The dog ate my homework. I uh, didn't get that text or my Wi-Fi was out or whatever. He says, hey, you have had so many opportunities, and he shares with, with them a bunch of Old Testament quotes. I think what's actually kind of a cool here is Paul uses the Old Testament massively. It is important to Paul. In fact, one-third, I heard Doug Moose say this, um, Doug, Douglas Moose said that one-third of Paul's Old Testament quotes are in chapters 9, 10, and 11 of the book of Romans. That's an incredible amount. So right here, he's, he's quoting from Isaiah 52, which is referenced from Nahum 115, how their voice has gone out in the world and the ends of the house. What's so cool about this is he's kind of saying, hey, you guys have known from what I'm quoting here and what's going on that, that what the Assyrians and, and Nahum, when he's talking about this, and he sends this reluctant prophet that Jeremy talked to us about a few weeks ago, Jonah, um, that to, to go to them. So we knew God had this heart for the Assyrians, even the enemies, the Gentile enemies of God, that God had this heart of evangelism and mission to them. And, that, and he weaves these passages together to show this importance. So he quotes from Isaiah 52, Psalm 19, Deuteronomy 30, um, and then, I mean, so he's, he's going over and showing this. It, the Israelites didn't totally get God's plan that included Gentiles, and he's saying, hey, listen, Moses said this, verse 19, and I said, didn't Israel not understand? First, Moses said, and he says, hey, I told you back in Moses that I'm going to make you jealous, who are not a nation, with a foolish nation. I will make you angry. He told them this back in Joel, how he's going to make a people. They're not a people. And this is what we, the church becomes, is this, we who are not a people. That God's plan for the nations has been revealed here. And he has told them, and they are not without excuse, so he quoted this. So if God has given all the steps of someone to call that they believe, and someone who's heralded, and someone was sent, and all of these things. How then did they not know? What's the missing thing then? Well, verse 13, 16 then shows us that. But they have not obeyed the gospel. That the link between the chain of requirements and someone calling is their faith. Belief, receiving, accepting, resting, relying, depending on, obeying the gospel. People cannot call on the Lord if they do not believe. And it's not for lack of opportunities that the Jews have had to believe. It's their lack of belief in him. And if you are here and do not know Christ as your Savior, it is not for lack of opportunity. It's for lack of So no one will be able to stand and say, I didn't hear, I didn't know, why didn't no one tell me about this? You've heard many, many times through repent and believe in Christ. So it is important for God to send preachers, and it is important for preachers to go. This is an important thing. If God sends, they go. Now look back on the plan that God said, the plan that the steps call, believe, hear, preach, send. In reverse, send, preach, hear, believe, call. 
is there a place that this breaks down? Will anyone who calls on the name of the Lord not be saved? No, it says those who call on the Lord will be saved. It's not going to break down there. Will anyone who believes not call? No, that's not airtight too, because he said that it, that, that goes back to Romans 8. Those who's called, he's predetermined who they're going to come. It's an effectual call of God. So people that will hear the gospel when it's preached, when the gospel's preached, will people hear it? Yes, he's already told us that. He's going to do that. He even told us we have a confidence of this because we see this in Revelation that around the throne there's people from every kindred, tribe, and nation around the throne. It's encouraging us, emboldening us for this missional work, this gospel work. Is God still sending, if thus it be sent, is God sending people to proclaim this message? Yes, he commanded us five times. He gave it to us in the, the, this great commission. He told you he's commissioned every one of us to do this. So where could this plan break down? When God's people don't share the gospel. That's where it breaks down. Because call, believe, hear, preach, send. Send, preach, hear, believe, call. The breakdown is when those that are sent don't share. Paul had an urgency to get this message to everywhere on earth. The gift that can save anybody, that anybody can have. But in order to receive that gift, they have to hear about it. You can't put faith in something you've never even heard about. And the preaching of the gospel, then, is this essential part of the process. This is why missions is so important. This is why personal evangelism is so important. If this is true, if it is true that there is a God and there is a heaven and there is a hell, then it should change us. So I ask you, how are your life's priorities different because of this truth? How are the priorities in your life? 20-something, 30-something, middle-ager, retiree, elderly. How are the priorities in your life different because of this truth? Um, I'd encourage you to go sometime to the Gospel Project um, website. And maybe even get their, I, I have like their um, prayer app feed that comes through. They track what are unreached people groups. And so of the four or five you know, six billion people in the world, they, an unreached group is a group of people, an ethnic group, that has less than 2% Christian, okay, um, would be considered unreached. And about half of the world's population is in that category. There are people that will be born, live their lives, have their kids, work their jobs, retire, and die, and not hear the gospel. There are people that live in 08221 that will be born, live, go to school within a shadow of this steeple, have their jobs, get married, have their kids, raise their kids, retire, and die without hearing the gospel. What are we going to do? It should change the way we think about how we're doing life. How does the way you're doing life make sense in light of this? Uh, I, we use that phrase with missions, think global, act local. That we need to think in this huge way, but we need to act in local ways. Um, you millennials and Gen Zers and alpha uh, generation out there, you're, you're, all, we're, you're already wired to think globally about the global world. And, and, you, and you have passions to tackle big problems like suffering and poverty and climate issues and, po and injustice. But I just want to submit to you that do you understand that eternal suffering lasts much longer than hunger does? That eternal suffering lasts much longer than injustice in this world lasts? So what greater cause could you give your life to than to, for people to hear the gospel message. Paul talked earlier about how he's a debtor both to the Jew and to the Greek to get this message here. 
J.D. Greer said this way, he said, with the privilege of knowing the gospel comes the responsibility of sharing it with others. So we have some applications to make for ourselves. Whether you're in that generation or the greatest generation or the boomer generation or the Xers or the Xennials or the millennials or the whatever, or whether you don't even know what the Millennium Falcon has to do with this sermon. Thank you. <laughs> Um, um, so, no, I felt good joking there. What are you doing with your life to do this? Do those in your life, do those in your life that you work with, that are your relatives, that are your neighbors, do they know about Jesus? Or, or, or if they stood before God today and they, kn they saw you going to heaven and them being turned away, would they be like, wait, wh why didn't you tell me that? I want to share a clip with you from a magician who is a very famous atheist named Penn Gillette. I want to share this clip with you. Mm. It's the one before that. And I've always said, you know, that I, I don't respect people who don't proselytize. I don't respect that at all. If you believe that there's a heaven and hell and people could be going to hell or not getting eternal life or whatever, and you think that, uh, well, it's not really worth telling them this because it would make it socially awkward. And atheists who think that people shouldn't proselytize, just leave me alone, keep your religion to yourself. Uh, how much do you have to hate somebody to not proselytize? How much do you have to hate somebody to believe that everlasting life is possible and not tell them that? I mean, if I believed beyond a shadow of a doubt that a truck was coming at you and you didn't believe it, that, that truck was bearing down on you, there's a certain point where I tackle you. And this is more important than that. You hear that? How much do you have to hate somebody to believe that everlasting life is possible? and not tell them about that. This should change the way we think and feel and act. And maybe God is working on some of your hearts, it, not on a specific way, but on a bigger way. Um, I'm not talking about farming it out or criticizing somebody else for the way they're doing it or not doing it the way you think they should or a way to uh, alleviate and excuse yourself. But God is calling you and me to do something about this. And I also want to share this way when on the bigger level of missions, that I think knowing the, the urgency of the gospel message, we should kind of flip the script a little bit. Because we kind of have this idea that, and there is truth, that our role is sending and preaching, and there are preachers who need to be sent, and some of us need to be sending missionaries, yes. But we often think that the majority are going to stay and help with the sending, and a few are going to go doing this, the going. And I want you to think that, that this, you shouldn't be thinking, I'm going to stay here unless God does something dramatic to tell me to go. But the, it should be that I'm going to do something and plan to go to the nations to get the gospel there and stay only if God calls me to that. Um, I heard it this way, it said, God doesn't call everyone to be a missionary, every Christian to be a missionary, but every Christian should struggle with the possibility. So here's what I want to challenge you. If there's not been a time in your life, if there has not been a time in your life that you surrendered to missions, and, and, I, and I'm, I'm not talking just young, I'm saying like that, that you're, uh, God, I'll, I'll spend my life, I will I, I'll, I'll plan to be a missionary, I'll do a language school thing, I'll, I'll go. Or, or you're in retirement and you're thinking, I, you know what, God, the, the nest egg's yours. If you want me to use it for this, if you want me to go, if you want me to donate this, uh, I'll, I'll go. If there's not been a time that you've surrendered your life to missions, I want to challenge you today to do it. That you, that you take the hands like this and make them like this. I'll go where you want me to go, dear Lord. I, I, I'll say what you want me to say. I, I'll go. That, that's, we shouldn't have this. I'll hang on just in case he's calling me or pulling me. And, and I mean, isn't that terrible when we hear testimonies of people like how God was calling me 
and I didn't want to go, so I just fought it. And, and it's like, so is God's army really filled with all these people that he had to, like, beat to get to, to go be missionaries, and it was, like, all terrible for them? No, it's the opposite, that we ought to have this, that I'll go. So are you being called to missionary service in retirement, to leave, to be sent? That might be on a long-term basis. That might be on a short-term basis. On, to go on a field. It might be, maybe you are in retirement and you're like, hey, I know some folks around here. I know some of your guys' friends. Hey, there's a Christian camp here or there that they could use my help volunteer in, in the summer months. I got the summers off. I could do that. I could go for three months here. Or, hey, I've got some skills and we know this missionary. I, I could, so, so that we're not thinking, oh, maybe if. That you think, hey, I got, I got two weeks of vacation. I got three weeks of vacation. I got four weeks of vacation. I, you know, I could, I, we, we could do a mission trip with one of those or I could do this here or I could use part of that for something in my, in, in, in my family's life to, to, to foster the gospel, or that we would just think in that, those terms, that we are all an agent of sending or preaching. And so we are, so to be willing to be the going, but also to be passionate about the sending. Because we know there's some people that are not going to be, that's not their calling, but we, we as a church are a sending church. Like, like this is this, we're sent. We're, each of you are sent in your ways, and then we as a church send others. And, and this is where we're going to talk about money, because this is part of what we do, and we've got a heritage of this as a church, of sending missionaries from our congregation, but also in supporting missionaries and helping send them in our financial giving. And so I'm not talking about, like, you know, designating something, or I'm not upset with this, so I'm going to give to this or whatever, because I know, like, our missions committee would, like, love to have our missionaries back at a level of support that they maybe were before. And the good news is that, that God has already provided enough money in our church to do that. The problem is, some people haven't given it yet. They can't budget based upon something here or there. They, they have this. So this is a call for us to, to that, that flip the options, that, that Christian's going to live differently, that every Christian, you're going to live differently than the people around you because you're thinking, I need to save and prepare, but I'm also thinking I want to give because I'm part of this getting the gospel out. This is a cause bigger than me. So who are the agents in your life? that help get the gospel to you and who are the folks that you're going to be the agent of to get the gospel to them because this passage showed us God's plan for every nation and the urgency of evangelism when he sends us I want to close with uh, reading uh, end of a chapter here by David Platt he shares a story about how they're in, these are friends in this Southeast Asia country and they're trying to share them with the gospel. And he says, how are you created? They, they, they don't know. He said, well, who sends the raindrops? I, I don't know that either. Or what happens when you die? Well, no one's been here to tell us that yet. And the man goes into his uh, house and comes out with a can of Coca-Cola. And he's uh, kind of broken. He's like, how can a, 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 a soda company in Atlanta, Georgia, have reached more of these people than the Church of Jesus Christ that's been doing this for 2,000 years? And so he ends with this, that this is a cause worth living for. It's a cause worth dying for. It's a cause worth moving urgently on. We have the gospel of Christ, and we do not have time to waste. Some wonder if it is unfair to God allow so many people to know, have no knowledge of the gospel. If there's no injustice with God, the injustice lies in Christians who possess the gospel and refuse to give their lives to make it known among those who haven't, haven't heard. That is unfair. I find it interesting that one of the most common questions asked today in, of Christians is, what is God's will for my life? Or how do I find God's will for my life? And many Christians have, have almost assumed the attitude that they would obey God if he would just show them what he wanted them to do. In the middle of a Christian culture asking, how do I find God's will for my life? I bring you good news. His will is not lost. With 1.4 million Bedouins in Algeria who have never even heard the gospel, it makes little sense to sit, sit over here asking, what do you want me to do, God? The answer is clear. The will of God for you and me is to give our lives urgently and recklessly to making the gospel and the glory of God known among all people, particularly those who've never heard of Jesus. The question, therefore, is not, can we find God's will? The question is, will we, be obe will we obey God's will? Will we refuse to sit back and wait for some tiny feeling to grow go down our spines before we rise up and do what we've already been commanded to do? Will we risk everything, our comfort, our possessions, our safety, our security, 
our very lives to make the gospel known among unchurched peoples. Such rising up, such risk-taking is an unavoidable, urgent result of a life that is radically abandoned to Jesus. So how will they call on whom they have not believed? How will they believe in whom they have not heard? How will they hear without preaching? And how will they preach unless they be sent? We have to send so they can preach, so they can hear, so they believe, so that they'll call. And those that call will believe because they heard, because they preached, because someone was sent. And the end of the message is this, brothers and sisters. Every single one in this room is 